Welcome to this CPD presentation by me, Christian Harris, the founder of Slip Safety Services. This session is called Specifying Safe Services and is designed for architects and other specifiers to give a broad understanding of the vagaries of slip resistance and therefore what you should be doing to ensure you're meeting your duty of care in providing safe environments for the users of your buildings. Uh, first, a little bit about me to give some context. I've been working in this field for over 10 years. I've acted as an expert witness in various court cases. For example, perhaps the most prominent being one where a gentleman actually died as a result of a slip in a co-op store in Truro a few years ago, and we'll touch on that a bit more later on. My business and I uh, support a range of clients and partners from insurance companies, uh, architects like yourself, corporate clients, lawyers, FM companies, floor suppliers, construction companies, etc., etc. And some of the blue chip names uh, are visible there on the slide. So why are we producing this CPD? Well, as we'll get into Slip resistance is a huge topic and it's really vitally important for you as a specifier to get this right. So we're aiming to provide you with the background and the information that enables you to do that. Secondly, there are a range of slip resistance CPDs available, but typically, uh, almost universally, these are done by floor material suppliers who clearly have a, a slight vested interest and yes I'm sure they give good information uh, but that's always going to be kind of funneling you in one direction. We are a service provider as we'll touch on but we don't have any uh, affiliations with any particular type of material or supplier of material and therefore our advice is totally unbiased. Thirdly, uh, the idea of this is that you can benefit from our experience. So that's both practical experience, helping clients, it's experience with the insurers with whom we work, so we know what they're looking for, and it's the experience of being involved in court cases and uh, claims defence from a legal perspective. So we can draw all of that together um, to give you, hopefully, a bit of a broader experience than I think you would get uh, in another CPD from a flooring supplier. So what will we cover? We'll talk about the extent of this problem and why it's important. We'll go through uh, something that's clearly very important, which is testing methods. So how do you test for slip resistance? What do you need to know? And what do you need to do with that information? And we'll talk a little bit about solutions that are available for achieving a balance between aesthetic and slip safety. Okay, let's crack on. So firstly, why is slip safety important? So if you look purely at the human cost of slips, it's fairly large to say the least. So every year in the UK, over 300,000 people are admitted to A&E following a slip and that results in one and a half million NHS bed days. Clearly there are lots of accidents on top of that, um, that where people are getting hurt, but they're not necessarily going straight to A&E. So if you sprain your ankle, for example, or even have a, um, you may have a break or a fracture of your ankle, but you don't really quite realise it at the time, you might not go straight to A&E. 95% of serious slips result in a broken bone. That's by far the most common type of injury we see after a slip. But a few times a year, these accidents do turn out to be even more serious. So I referred to this first case of the death in Truro, where this gentleman slipped, uh, banged the back of his head and sadly passed away as a result. And every year, there are about a dozen amputations as a result of slips as well. So yes, there are lots of slips that 
aren't serious and indeed don't even lead to injuries. There are a very large amount of more minor injuries like broken bones, if you can call that a minor injury. But there are lots and lots of more serious injuries too, uh, such as these and lots of brain injuries and things like that. From an insurance perspective, about a third of insurance claims by both volume and value are caused by slip accidents. And that's pretty much consistent across most sectors. It's higher in some and a bit lower in others. Uh, but if you have that as a, as a ballpark figure, you wouldn't be far wrong. The average uh, insurance claim cost for a slip is about £10,000. It's slightly more for a staff member making a claim through employer's liability and a bit less for a public liability claim but there are a lot more um, public liability claims so the average does work out at about £10,000 and if you add all of these claims together that comes to a total annual cost in the UK of over a billion pounds so two and a half to three million pounds a day of claims are being paid out uh, due to slips. And from a client perspective, uh, you're creating buildings for clients to use and work in or, or play in. And the slip cost of £10,000, when you translate it into a client's perspective, um, just gives an interesting way of, of looking at this. So for, for, for McDonald's to make £10,000 of net profit from selling Big Macs in order to cover the cost of one slip claim, they've got to sell almost 20,000 Big Macs. If you're Tesco, to make £10,000 of profit, because your margin is a lot lower, you've got to sell almost a quarter of a million bunches of bananas. So whilst these accidents sometimes can be portrayed as being rather trivial, actually these are some significant numbers when it comes to uh, end customers, corporate customers, and what they need to produce in order to cover just sing just one single slip accident claim cost. So overall then we've got a problem which is costing society billions of pounds a year. We've got the human cost, we've got the insurance costs, we've got the cost to the NHS, but we've also got the hidden uninsured costs to companies as well. And the HSE estimates that for every pound spent on an insurance claim, the company incurs a cost of between eight and 36 pounds from what they call hidden uninsured costs. So overall, we're talking about a massive, massive problem here. From your perspective as a specifier, clearly you want to design responsibly and you want to adhere to all rules and regulations and produce a building that is both aesthetically pleasing but practical and safe for people to use and clearly you want to protect both your practice and yourself from any issues that might result from a uh, poor or misled specification so these are the main goals that we've got in the rest of this CPD to give you guys watching this the information that you need uh, to avoid any issues. So why do slips happen? The first thing to say is that it's not just about the floor. So we see lots of beautiful uh, floors like this terrazzo here, shining, glistening, looking lovely. Uh, if that floor were to become wet, I would uh, put a rather large amount of money on the fact that it would be very slippery and potentially hazardous to people walking on it. But the floor itself is not the only reason why somebody might slip. In fact, there are six reasons why somebody might slip, and we've created an acronym around these called CHIMES. So C is for contamination. Essentially, if you've got a clean and a dry floor, it's almost impossible for somebody to slip on it. But as soon as you introduce any contaminants, whether that be water ingress from outside 
or a spillage of some kind, or even dry contamination such as dust, a floor can become slippery. H is for heel, so clearly uh, for a slip to occur you need a foot touching a floor because if there's no foot then there's no slip. The extent to which you can control the heel does vary, but if you've got a very slip resistant shoe then the risk of slipping will clearly be much lower. I is for individual. So consider this, if you're walking along at a normal pace on a flat surface in a straight line, your requirement for friction is normal. If however you are twisting, turning, pushing, pulling, carrying or rushing, then you've got a much greater requirement for friction. If you're walking along and you're looking at your phone or you're distracted by some noise or a video screen or something like that, you're less likely to see a potential hazard and that may result in you slipping if, for example, there's a puddle of water on the floor and you didn't see it. So the human factors play a role in why somebody slips, for sure. M is for maintenance and this is all about the floor surface over time, so the way that a floor is cleaned will have a dramatic effect on its slip resistance over time, and the way the floor is maintained from the perspective of wear and tear will also have a big effect. E is for environment, so the graphic here represents the weather, which is clearly important, uh, but this also includes things like lighting, ambient noise, but also slopes steps and stairs, uh, and things like that. And finally, S is for surface. So how slip resistant is the surface of the floor itself? Now you'll see from that brief explanation that all of these things are to some extent interrelated. So contamination, maintenance, surface, you know, these all fit together uh, within one kind of system. You can have a very good slip resistant surface but if you've got very difficult contamination and a very poor maintenance regime, that surface will become slippery. So from your perspective, it's about understanding which of these are controllable and which aren't. And then importantly, to what extent can they be controlled during your work, during the design and the specification of buildings? So a few example things to consider here, and there's many more, um, much, much more detail sitting below all of these, but here are just some headlines to get you thinking. Uh, contamination, you know, can we eliminate contamination through design somehow? So things like drip trays in manufacturing facilities is a good example uh, of that. Uh, hand dryers um, don't have hand dryers in washrooms that don't have trays in them because you're just spreading liquid all over the floor individual, um, can we design buildings in such a way that the staff or customer journey avoids twisting, turning, um, perhaps takes place in a more linear fashion. So we're eliminating these risks of kind of non-standard walking practices. When it comes to the environment, can we think about eliminating single steps, which present a, a much larger, larger hazard than a flight of stairs, uh, limiting slopes. Can we think about entrance matting, depth and specification? Most buildings that I see have disastrously poor depth of entrance matting installed. So if you follow the HSE guidance, if you've got a peak traffic flow of 800 people an hour, you should have a depth of entrance matting of eight linear meters inside the building. Now, how many buildings do you see that achieve that? Almost none. And therefore, if you don't have that, we need to think about other things that we can do to help control the slip risk. So canopies, but also then the surface inside that door should probably be more slip resistant than if you did have the full depth of matting. Surface, we'll touch upon this more in a moment, but can we ensure during our specification phase 
that we're choosing floors that are safe when wet in the areas where that's needed. So the floor isn't the only thing, but arguably it is the most important. This is some data from a study in the US showing uh, causes of slips in restaurants as a percentage. And as you can see, flooring accounts for a full half of the causation of accidents according to the study. Here's our first free resource for you, bearing these points in mind, which is called the Slip Safety Scorecard. This is a digital diagnostic tool. Uh, you go onto the website and the address is there. You answer a series of yes, no questions, which takes probably about six or seven minutes. And the output of that is a report which runs to over 30 pages and it gives you an idea of how you're performing currently versus best practice under each of the six areas of chimes. It'll then give you some tips, hints and hacks on what you can do to improve. So this could be valuable for you uh, if you're putting together a specification to think about shaping that from a slip perspective or let's say you're looking at some kind of refurbishment or reuse or re-engineering project, you could take the scorecard and figure out the current position and it would start to highlight some of the areas that you could improve as part of your work. So just what is a safe floor? We'll answer this question by looking at a few uh, subheadings, so we'll talk about slip resistance testing, dry versus wet slip resistance, and then we'll consider what can make a safe floor unsafe. So when it comes to slip resistance testing, and I apologise in advance for the bad pun, um, most people don't know their R's from their elbow. Again, I do apologise, but I had to put it in there. Um, Basically, what we see is a lot of confusion. There are all these acronyms, all these test methods, all these names, lots and lots of misinformation, uh, and the UK has a different standard to other parts of the world. So it's understandable that, uh, from your perspective, this may not be 100% clear in your mind. So let's cut through that noise and let's clarify exactly what it is you need to know about slip resistance testing. In the UK, you've got to use the pendulum test. This is the only test that the HSE use. It's the only test that is ever used in court. And therefore, it's the gold standard. It's the test that you need to use in your specification. It's called a pendulum test because it swings. And I've got a video uh, which I'm going to show you in a second of, of the test being used. But effectively what this test does is it mimics the interaction between the heel and the floor. On the bottom of the foot of the pendulum we have a rubber slider and there are two types of slider. There's a slider 96 which is used in shod environments and a slider 55 which is used in barefoot environments. And we standardised the slider so that the testing is solely about the floor. So all we're testing with the pendulum test is the slip resistance provided by the floor. Just quickly on the sliders, it's important to understand which slider is for which use and in which circumstances you need to use one or the other or indeed both. So if you had a shopping mall or an office reception floor you would only need to use the slider 96 because every user of that floor is going to have shoes on. If though you were testing uh, a hotel bedroom or a leisure centre changing room, you're going to have both shod and barefoot users and therefore you need to test using both sliders and make sure that you achieve the right level of slip resistance using both sliders. The output of this test is called a pendulum test value, which is a number. And we'll show you the video of how the test works, and then we'll explore what exactly the numbers mean. 
So this is a video of the pendulum test being used in a leisure club changing room. And as you'll see, the operative here wets the floor, he releases the arm of the pendulum, it swings through, strikes the floor, mimicking the interaction between the heel and the floor when someone is walking, and it swings through the other side. And you'll see there that there is a pointer on the gauge on the left hand side and that is what is giving you the result of the test. Now if we swing the foot through without it striking the floor, the foot swings from horizontal to horizontal and that pointer points to zero on the gauge. The more slip resistance there is, the foot is decelerated as, it's, as it contacts the floor and therefore it swings through less far and you get a higher number. So the higher the number, the more slip resistance. Let's just watch it again to give you another look. There we go. So I think you can see from that the design of the machine to mimic a slip. You know, you've got that kind of 45-ish degree, it's not 45 degrees, but 30 degree or whatever it is, uh, interaction, uh, striking of the heel onto the floor. And I think showing you how the test works brings it to life and is a very useful thing to have seen. So what do the numbers mean? What does PTV, pendulum test value, mean? There are three categories of slip potential, depending on the PTV achieved in the test. Anything between 0 and 24 is a high slip potential. Anything between 25 and 35 is a moderate slip potential. And anything of 36 and above PTV is a low slip potential. The numbers are exactly the same whether you use a dry test or a wet test. So you might test a floor dry and it comfortably exceeds 36 PTV, but when it's wet, it's down in that red zone of 24 or, or lower. You could have other floor surfaces where the dry and the wet are more similar, but you would always test both. And it's important to understand that the two will vary. We can take the PTV a step further and correlate it to risk as well. So here you can see if you have a PTV of 36, which is in the low slip potential category, then the risk of somebody slipping uh, is, uh, according to HSE, perceived to be one in a million. Whereas if you are in the high slip potential category with a PTV of 24, then the risk exposure is one in 20 or 19 or less uh, PTV, the risk is one in two. So you can see it's an exponential curve. Small improvements in PTV do have quite a massive impact on the risk exposure. One thing to bear in mind, if you have any slopes or ramps in buildings, you need to slightly alter the interpretation of the results. So if we were testing on a slope, we would get the same score on the pendulum, on that material, on the slope, as if we were testing the same material on a flat surface, but we would simply interpret the pendulum test value slightly differently. So for every degree of slope, you add on 1.75 PTV to the requirement. What does that mean? It means that on a flat surface, 36 is a low slip potential, but if you have a one degree slope, 36 would actually be a moderate slip potential because you would need to achieve 38, in other words, 36 plus the 1.75 to have that same low slip potential. We alluded to R ratings earlier, and those are probably the most common type of slip resistance specification that we see over and above uh, PTV 
Uh, that's a very common method of testing in Europe, for example. And certainly when I first got involved in this world a decade ago, uh, it was much more common for architects like you to be talking about R ratings than PTV. We have slowly uh, shifted that, and I think more people are talking about PTV now, but we still see far too much talk of R ratings. To give you an idea of why the HSE, uh, who of course consider all of these testing methods, uh, don't really like the R rating, let's have a look at some correlations between R rating and PTV. So R9 is um, very, very common in uh, specifications and is often deemed to be a anti-slip surface, but actually when put under the rigour of a pendulum test, in wet conditions the pendulum test value is between 11 and 18, so it's actually got a high slip potential. R10 is arguably the most uh, dangerous to specify because as you can see there's a huge range there in PTV ranging from 18 which is a high slip potential and a 1 in 2 risk all the way through to 34 which is a moderate slip potential and about a 1 in 100,000 accident risk exposure. So you can see straight away Installing an R10, you don't really know what you've got because the banding of the R rating is too broad. It's not specific enough for you to really specify considerately, carefully and safely. Similar story with R11, which can be most of the time a low slip potential, but it's possible it's in the moderate. So it's not really until you get to an R12 that you can be certain that you've got a floor surface which is anti-slip or slip resistant when wet. And from a barefoot perspective, ABC ratings have a similar kind of issue. You're not 100% sure exactly what you've got and therefore you've got to use the pendulum. You've got to get a PTV in dry and wet conditions using the right slider for the use of that floor. Dry versus wet is uh, a distinction that needs to be made. You've got to understand both. Uh, I've seen manufacturers or resellers of diamond floor polishing pads in the past who have been trying to sell their uh, cleaning system as something that enhances the slip resistance of the floor and they've quoted well you have to be PTV 36 to be a low risk and this achieves a PTV of 100 so therefore it must be very low risk and that of course is theoretically correct however that's talking very clearly about the dry slip resistance and not the wet slip resistance. People don't slip in the dry uh, the question for them is, well, what does this do in the wet? And uh, the reason that they're talking about the dry uh, PTV is because in the wet, those types of pads don't achieve a very good PTV because they're polishing and smoothing uh, the surface and making it more slippery when wet. One interesting point to be aware of is that there's often an inverse correlation between wet and dry PTV. So a polished smooth stone surface like the one on the left here would typically have a very very high dry PTV but a low wet PTV. Moving across to this um, resin kind of surface the dry PTV would be significantly lower than the polished tile but the wet PTV would be significantly higher. So in my experience on these types of different floors, you might see a dry pendulum test value on a, a polished stone like that of 70, 80, 90, 100, but the wet PTV is likely to be uh, even as low as in the single digits, but certainly below 25. On the highly textured resin surface, the dry PTV is probably going to be uh, in the 50s or 60s, but the wet PTV 
is going to be in the mid 40s to mid 50s. So again, a much closer um, spread between dry and wet in these kind of anti-slip surfaces versus the the smoother surfaces. So something <clears throat> something just to be aware of. So now we know what makes a safe floor, what can stop a floor from being safe? Because this is also important for you to understand. There are three things to highlight. The first is incorrect installation. So two photographs here. The top one shows grout hazing, which you'll no doubt be familiar with uh, from projects over the years. Mm -hmm. Now, any contamination within the surface of a tile like that is going to inhibit the slip resistance. And grout hazing, as you, I'm sure, know, isn't always visible to the naked eye there and then. It's only sometimes a few days later or a few weeks later even that it starts to show up because it's acting as a magnet for dirt to cling to the tile uh, when actually the tile should be relatively easy to clean. So if that floor surface isn't cleaned effectively and properly and correctly professionally as part of handover, then there's a good chance that it may not achieve the slip resistance that you had specified. The below photograph is an example of a floor that has been sealed and you can see the top half is shiny and the bottom half uh, which has been sealed is not. Any application of sealant, particularly that type of topical sealant on, on top of the surface, is fundamentally going to change the surface and therefore will have a big effect on the slip resistance. So anything that involves sealing, polishing, etc., needs to have a test done uh, on a sample just to be sure that it's not going to cause any problems. Secondly, once a building is open, um, cleaning becomes a really critical control measure uh, because if you do ineffective cleaning, like we can see here in these photographs, then the floor becomes contaminated and the foot of the user doesn't touch the safe floor. It touches the contamination, which is greasy, slippery, and that's when a slip can happen. So on this top photograph, which is obviously a changing village in a leisure centre, the pendulum test value of the floor when it's cleaned, like in that sample area, was above 36 when wet, so a very safe floor. But testing the floor surface as we found it, heavily contaminated, we were getting a pendulum test value of 27, so 1 in 200 risk. So you had a safe floor, the safe floor was chosen uh, and correctly installed, it would seem, but over the years, the ineffective cleaning has led to that floor becoming unsafe. And the third thing is clearly that floors will wear and therefore change over time. So you will see over the life cycle of a floor a differing level of slip resistance over time. So it's important that we clarify the slip resistance throughout the life of the floor. It's not good enough just to specify the right level of slip, slip resistance of a floor. You need to check it, test it at handover to prove that you've actually handed over the floor surface that was supposed to be handed over. And then I think from a responsible design perspective, you should be giving very clear and effective cleaning guidance to customers, but also recommending ongoing testing to check that floor surfaces continue to perform. So yes, don't just test X, uh, X factory, but also before handover and ongoing. So you're probably now thinking, okay, I understand what test I need. Um, I understand what the numbers mean broadly. So what do I need to specify where? The first thing I'd say is that not every floor needs to be anti-slip. Not every floor needs to be safe when wet, because actually not all floors are likely to get wet. And according to uh, precedent and the law, it's all about 
reasonable practicality and it's all about understanding the end use of the floor. So here's an example of some different environments within a hotel and you're not going to need the same level of slip resistance in dry or wet conditions in all of these different areas. So we need to think about where we need to have safe when wet floors and where we don't. So in the corridor leading between rooms, you don't need a safe when wet floor because it's very unlikely that that floor is ever going to get wet. In a poolside or a changing room or showers or in a kitchen, well, of course, those floors are going to get wet and contaminated and therefore they need to be safe when they're wet. In a guest bathroom as well, I think you'd struggle to argue in a court of law that a hotel guest bathroom is designed to be dry when you've got shower, bath, bathtub, sink, etc. How about a, a lobby? Well, potentially, but potentially not, because there are other control measures, as we talked about earlier, that might be in place that, that could mean that you don't necessarily need a floor that's particularly safe when wet. Perhaps, in that case, a moderate slip potential when wet might be okay. A servery in a restaurant. Again, there's a very good chance that spillages may occur in this area, but there could be some other control measures that, that are in place that are effective that mean that you don't necessarily need a low slip potential when wet surface on the floor there. So it's not black and white, it does need some thought and it does need some good understanding. To aid you with that, here's our second free resource, which is our slip specification guide. It's another digital tool. Uh, go to the website, you enter the sector of the building you're looking at and the area, and it will give you some guidance on the minimum wet pendulum test value that you should have on the floor in that area and explain why uh, and talk about some other control measures that could be in place uh, that might change that view from the perspective of well here's the minimum but actually you might need to go above that minimum because of x y and z so this i think could be a very valuable tool for you on pretty much any project so that you can achieve as this diagram illustrates the correct kind of zonal approach to slip safety in the buildings that you're designing one thing i would say which is a trend that i've seen become increasingly prevalent in recent years is don't over specify very very grippy very very textured surfaces where they're not needed so this photo uh, is in a shopping center and a very very and extremely uh, textured surface has been specified which is um, achieving well above 36 plus in wet conditions but actually that's then become, as you can see in the image, a huge cleaning issue. And because it's a cleaning issue, it's actually become less safe than it's designed to be. As the last bullet point here says, a surface that starts at 55 PTV when wet can quickly become a surface that achieves PTV 25. It's actually easier to maintain slip resistance when you start a little bit lower uh, than it is when you start too high. So a surface that has a PTV of 38, 39 is typically going to be a lot less textured and a lot easier to clean than a surface that has a PTV of 55. And therefore, in the real world, where these floors are used, uh, trafficked and cleaned, you're more likely to see that surface that starts life a little bit lower, but still fine, achieve a consistent, sustainable level of slip resistance than a surface that's over-specified. What though about wet areas where you have a particular aesthetic in mind? This of course is going to be a, a salient question for, for you, I'm sure. 
So back in the olden days, uh, you were faced with a fairly stark choice. It was either looks or safety. Nowadays, though, technology has moved on at quite a pace and it is possible to anti-slip treat pretty much any floor surface to make it safe without compromising its aesthetic. Now, the way this is done will vary depending on the floor type. So the way you do it on a wood is different to a tile, is different to a marble, is different to a vinyl, etc. Uh, but pretty much any surface, something can be done that will be aesthetically pleasing, acceptable, uh, but will achieve a good level of wet slip resistance. Here's an example on a porcelain tile and the right hand side of this tile has been treated but you can see on the left hand photo it still has very good reflection and on the right hand side of the photo you can maybe just about see a slight difference in in colour but I think if you did the whole floor uh, nobody would ever be any the wiser um, and so that just gives you an idea that you can you can achieve uh, a good aesthetic and a safe surface uh, and so you can kind of tick both of those boxes. Third free resource for you is that we would be happy to conduct anti-slip samples on any surfaces you wanted to send to us. Uh, we will slip test them, then treat them and slip test them again. So you'll have the before and after uh, slip resistance. You'll also have the sample to look at, touch and feel and see what you think and we'll send that back to you and that potentially opens the door to more specification choices for you going forward. So you can send us an email or give us a call and we'd be happy to do that for you. So briefly then, how can we help you uh, over and above the couple of things we've already mentioned? So I think throughout the project and post project, there are things we can help with. So right at the start, uh, we can help by uh, giving you the, 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 the pointers and also the testing data to specify the right slip resistance on the right surfaces uh, in different areas of buildings. We can also advise on cleaning regimes. And in my experience, the cleaning regimes that are typically uh, put into o &M manuals by manufacturers tend to be very generalist and uh, in reality not particularly effective from a contamination control perspective or a slip resistance perspective. So I think it's always worth double checking that with somebody that knows what they're talking about. And just to be clear, we don't make or sell any cleaning products or equipment or anything like that. So again, our advice on that is, is totally unbiased. Uh, during the project, I guess towards the end of the project, but during it, uh, we can help with undertaking any anti-slip treatments that might be needed. Uh, we can get involved in doing deep cleaning to, uh, for example, ensure that that grout hazing residue uh, issue isn't a problem. Uh, and we could also help potentially with other specialist floor care, uh, sealing, polishing, floor restoration, and things like that. And then I think importantly, um, you should be calling on us to uh, come into the project just as it's being handed over and test all of the floors to uh, ins firstly ensure and secondly provide a certificate to prove that they do adhere to the specification that you have set. You know, we have seen over the years uh, contractors swapping out materials for things that, uh, in inverted commas, look the same, but actually don't achieve the same um, specification from a safety perspective. So there's things like that, uh, that it's always worth getting a an independent test done just to make sure uh, again you're being responsible and you are handing over that building to the client per the specification that you've agreed. And then after handover we can be helping to monitor the slip safety over time as we touched on earlier and if we're doing any uh, anti-slip works or any deep cleaning works we would typically advise a plan preventative maintenance approach so that we come in perhaps once a year or once every six months, depending on uh, the need, and uh, 
maintain those floors, slip test them, and so there's a constant level of testing and certification that is really invaluable uh, when it comes to uh, preventing accidents but also defending any claims. So let's recap on the key learnings and talk about some of the follow-ups. So slips are a huge problem with a human and financial cost associated to them. There are six causes of slips, which we've put into an acronym called CHIMES. Contamination, heal, individual, maintenance, environment, surface. But the floor surface is absolutely critical. Um, a floor is always going to be involved. A floor um, is one of the things that can be controlled, particularly in the context of um, specification and, and projects such as you're going to be dealing with. It can be a bit confusing, there's a lot of jargon, uh, there are a lot of different tests, there are a lot of different acronyms around slip resistance. Uh, you've just got to remember PTV, that's the key thing you need. You need PTV, you need dry and wet, and you need the right slider. But remember, don't over specify slip resistance either. And of course, remember, not all floors need to be anti-slip. There are three things to bear in mind that will cause good slip resistant floors to become less safe. Issues with installation is one. Secondly, ineffective cleaning. And thirdly, wear over time. So be mindful of all those three things. Anti-slip treatment technology is now at a point where you can make almost any floor safe, uh, which enables you to specify on aesthetics. And in terms of testing, yes, test at the specification stage, but critically, test a handover. And actually, I would also suggest trying to embed some ongoing testing as well. We, uh, as hopefully you can see from the content we've delivered today, can help with all of the above, plus there's some other things that we might be able to help you with too. Now, if you've got any questions, We've created a, an FAQ section, which you can find on the internet if you go to this address. Um, if there's anything there, uh, sorry, anything that isn't there that you'd like to ask, then please send us an email uh, using the address there. Or you can give us a call. Um, we prefer an email because then we can add your question into the FAQs and then it's a living, breathing thing and will be helpful to uh, people that are enjoying this CPD in the future, whether that be your colleagues or people from other practices as well. And in terms of the resources we've mentioned, uh, when you email us, which we'll talk about in a second, uh, to get your certificate of attendance to the CPD, we'll also send you copies of these slides that I've presented, as well as uh, all the various resources that we mentioned, so the scorecard, the specification guide, etc. And if you're on LinkedIn, uh, I'd welcome you to uh, do a search for me. Uh, if you search for Christian Harris Slip Safety, uh, I'll be the first person to come up and uh, throw, a, throw me a connection request. Um, every day I do content on these topics, uh, which is educational and informative. So it's an opportunity uh, to continue to learn. And you can also see some of the projects that we get involved in uh, which might just ring a bell and make you think, ah, oh, um, I could do with some help in that area. So lastly, uh, to get your certificate and uh, to, to, uh, to receive the, uh, the list of resources, um, please send us an email to this address. So cpd at specsafefloors.co.uk cpd at specsafefloors.co.uk. Include your full name and your company, and we will revert with your certificate, and we'll send you a copy of the slides, as well as the various resources uh, that we have mentioned. So once again, cpd at 
floors.co.uk. That brings us to the end of the CPD. Thank you very much for your attention. I trust that it was useful and informative and uh, hopefully uh, you will get some value from it and it'll help you in any projects you're working on now or in the future. Hope to connect with you on LinkedIn and we will keep in touch over the coming weeks and months in case there's anything that we could be doing to help you. So with that, thanks again and have a good rest of the day.